So to start, as we know, sexual exploitation is a complex crime that can have considerable short and longer term impacts on victim survivors. There are effects on mental health, physical, sexual and reproductive health, financial and housing stability, as well as effects on identity, trust and feelings of safety. And then, of course, we know there are barriers to support. And these are well recognised and include fear of retaliation or judgement, not seeing oneself as a victim, feelings of internalised shame, financial and language barriers, not knowing where to seek support and limitations with the type and specialisation of support that is available or able to be accessed. So the literature suggests that the impacts and the support needs of victim survivors of sexual exploitation are not necessarily unique. However, it's also acknowledged that their support needs can be extensive, deeply ingrained and often requiring longer term approaches, which therefore require specifically designed programs of support. And so with this in mind, our study looked at the support needs and barriers to support for 50 victim survivors of sexual exploitation in Australia who received support from either Project Respect, Australian Red Cross, um, who delivers the Support for Trafficked People program uh, funded by the Australian government, or from both support services for a five-year period between 2015 and 2020. Uh, and so I should mention that there are is in fact no single or consistent legal definition of sexual exploitation that is used internationally or in Australia. However, for the purpose of our study, we use the term to refer to situations in which a perpetrator causes co uses coercion, threat or deception to force a person to provide sexual services. And that can be in a commercial or private setting. In practice, this could include situations where a person is deceived about providing sexual services, but also situations where they knowingly and willingly provide such services but are deceived about, for example, their working conditions, how much they will earn and any debt that they may incur. Sexual exploitation is also generally linked with crimes of slavery, servitude, forced labour and debt bondage. Uh, for this particular study, we analysed three information sources. Uh, the First is that we looked at de-identified administrative data from Project Respect and Red Cross, which contained basic demographic information, such as the victim survivor's age, gender, country of birth and visa status. Then we looked at de-identified case management records, which detailed victim survivors' circumstances and support needs, interactions that they had with caseworkers, referrals to other services, and also progress against client goals. And finally, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 12 staff members across both support services, most of whom were caseworkers for victim survivors contained within the data set. I'd also just like to acknowledge that the study did not involve victim, uh, victim survivor interviews. And this was primarily due to difficulties in, in locating the clients um, once they had, had left the service. Um, as well as ethical concerns around re-traumatisation from interviewing current clients, but also because clients who could participate in an interview would likely represent a subset of victim survivors who are well progressed in their recoveries. And so we decided that analysing case files for all clients was going to be a less biased method of understanding needs and uh, barriers. So in terms of the victim survivor sample, all 50 clients identified as female. Half were aged between 26 and 35 years, with the youngest client being a child aged 15 to 17 years, and the oldest client being aged uh, between 56 and 65 years. Just over half of clients were born in Southeast Asia, and most of the remaining clients were born in other parts of Asia, but two clients were also born in Australia. At the time of entering support, 10 out of 50 clients had secure residency status as either citizens or permanent residents, but three quarters were on a temporary visa, most commonly a bridging visa or a student visa. Two thirds of clients had children and half of those children were in Australia when the client entered support and half were living overseas. 
Uh, most clients had experienced sexual exploitation in the commercial sex industry, and there was also evidence of human trafficking for 41 out of 50 clients, which is 87%. So the analysis identified 11 support domains, and except for one of these categories, which related to alcohol and drug use, at least 50% of victim survivors expressed a need for support within each of these domains. Uh, further, and, and this is, is not surprising, most victim survivors needed support across multiple domains, with 80% of clients receiving support across five or more domains. So let's take a little bit of a deeper look. So most victim survivors, 90%, required support for financial hardship, and this was experienced prior to um, as well as throughout their engagement with service providers. This included the need for short-term and one-off payments to cover basic necessities and living expenses, such as food, clothing, toiletries, and mobile phones, um, as well as crisis accommodation, transportation, private rental bonds, and uh, the cost of medical care. And caseworkers also supported victim survivors with longer-term financial stability and independence by guiding them through application processes for welfare support, so things like living allowances, rental allowances, and child support payments, um, as well as helping them to open bank accounts and establish debt repayment plans for uh, loans, credit card debt, gambling debt, and infringement notices. Three quarters of victim survivors required crisis, short and or longer term accommodation. And there were two main requirements that came through in the analysis. So first, clients needed to leave unsafe circumstances where they lived uh, with uh, the perpetrator. They lived in the workplace where exploitation had occurred. They lived in large households where they were concerned about other housemates or they needed to leave temporary arrangements uh, living with relatives or friends. And second, housing was seen as the first step to overall safety, security and recovery. And so caseworkers supported clients by identifying accommodation options, re referring to crisis accommodation and public housing and assisting with private rental applications. Two thirds of survivors uh, needed employment and or education assistance, and their needs included working safely and legally in the sex industry, moving to new forms of employment and starting or completing study. Uh, support provided by caseworkers included uh, figuring out suitable options for employment and study, drafting job applications and assisting with study enrolments, preparing clients for interviews, uh, making referrals to specialist employment organisations and programs, um, as well as reimbursement of study costs. 90% of victim survivors required support for mental health. So that's 45 out of 50 victims, uh, victim survivors. Primarily, this was due to the impacts of the exploitation, but also the uncertainty surrounding their financial housing and visa situations which caused um, post-traumatic stress disorders, anxiety and depression, and symptoms such as compulsive behaviours, agoraphobia, which is where a person is afraid to leave the environments they know or consider to be safe, traumatic flashbacks and um, emotional dysregulation. Um, also of concern is the 19 victim survivors who mentioned self-harm, suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts. Half of victim survivors required support for their physical health, which included sexual health, unplanned pregnancies, physical injuries, and chronic pain. These conditions were sometimes pre-existing and exacerbated by experiences of exploitation, or they were caused by the exploitation itself. For example, as a result of long working hours, the number of customers they had to see each day, and acquiring uh, sexually transmitted infections. Very small numbers had support needs related to alcohol and drug use. Um, so there were only seven clients who uh, needed support for alcohol use and only uh, two clients who needed support for drug use. 80% of uh, clients needed support to improve their social and community engagement, which often related to feelings of loneliness and social isolation, having few emotional supports, language barriers and feelings of internalised shame about the either the nature of their work or, or having been exploited. 
And there was a mixed response from clients um, to supports um, that were provided, particularly around the organisation of or attendance at social events, which could be linked uh, with, with a service, so organised by a service or completely separate, so something that they've chosen to attend themselves, but which triggered fears of forming friendships um, outside of the sex industry and also the response from meeting someone new when they were prompted to discuss their past or current work if it came up in conversation. More than half of victim survivors held concerns for their safety. This related to fears of being located and harmed um, as a result of retribution and receiving previous and current threats to themselves or loved ones, including to their children. And they also had fear of persecution um, if they were to be repatriated. Half of victim survivors also had experienced or were experienced domestic and family violence, usually from a current or former intimate partner who could also be the person who had exploited them. And this ran the full gamut of violence types, um, so physical violence, stalking, emotional abuse and financial abuse. Three quarters of victim survivors had um, unresolved legal and visa issues, which related to both civil and criminal proceedings, um, and also, um, you know, the need for rectifying or transferring their visa. So our analysis identified several barriers at the individual interrelationship and systemic levels to supporting victim survivors of sexual exploitation. These barriers are not exhaustive, nor are they new. They will probably be very familiar to you, but they do affect the ability of caseworkers and other service providers to engage with victim survivors, as well as the quality of that engagement. So individual factors are specific to the individual characteristics and circumstances of victim survivors that affected the ability of service providers to engage with them both initially and over time. Shame associated with involvement in the sex industry and shame with being exploited was common. This was thought to have been drawn from internalised stigma as well as fear of what others thought about them. Next, clients often did not recognise themselves as a victim, either because they didn't see their situation as one of victimisation or because of shame and therefore denial about being a victim. And then there was fear and concerns for safety for themselves or for others, which came in the form of actual threats from perp perpetrators, um, as well as perceived risk of harm if they engage with support services um, or the police. Exacerbation of pre-existing um, or the onset of new mental health issues was also significant. So as noted earlier, 90% of victim survivors required support for their mental health. And some of these women struggled to engage with the mental health support um, provided, which was sometimes attributable to their mistrust of others, as well as the symptoms associated with their mental health issues, but also significant wait times, as well as financial barriers to accessing this type of support. This had an accumulative effect of victim survivors not engaging or disengaging with other support services as well. Trust was identified as the most significant interrelationship barrier, and this was largely a victim survivor's uh, trust with the range of professionals that they were coming into contact with. So people like counsellors, medical professionals and law enforcement. But some caseworkers found it difficult to gain the trust of their clients also, as clients were unwilling to open up to them about their circumstances. You know, they didn't believe um, that some things were their caseworkers' business and, um, you know, they weren't willing to tell caseworkers about some things that had changed um, in their lives, for example, changes in accommodation. Then there were systemic barriers which impacted um, ability to engage with victim survivors and, and to meet their needs. Four barriers were commonly cited. So first was visa and residency status. Uh, so as mentioned, 77% of clients were on a temporary visa, which had direct and significant impacts on their eligibility for support schemes uh, provided by um, the Australian government. So things like not being able to um, access uh, Medicare or government funded legal services, housing services or financial welfare schemes. 
And considering that these were significant needs for many of the victim survivors, often as a direct result of their exploitation, this placed serious financial strain uh, onto clients and in turn onto the services that were supporting them, uh, which would often be required to pay these fees. Then there was the genuine possibility of deportation because visas had expired um, or because victim survivors had not met the conditions of their visa, for example, the number, um, you know, the required number of study hours. And clients were often in limbo for long waiting periods for their visa issues to be rectified. Next, uh, despite 78% of clients needing support uh, with um, appropriate accommodation, many clients um, were not able to access stable accommodation during their engagement with support services and were often transient during this time. This affected caseworkers' ability to maintain regular contact with victim survivors and arrange conveniently located services, which um, sometimes led to long periods of, of disengagement. Support service eligibility was also an issue for victim survivors trying to access the Support for Trafficked People program delivered by Red Cross. Since its inception, referrals to this prog program can only be made by the AFP, although that looks to be changing in the near future. But this has meant that only victim survivors who are willing to engage with law enforcement can receive specialised support through this program. Obviously, a major concern with this is victim survivors' mistrust and prior negative experiences with police, not necessarily in Australia, that could be in their home country, um, but also the possibility of being exited from the program if their case, uh, you know, isn't progressed by police or prosecutors. These issues all had uh, significantly um, contributed to victim survivors fe uh, feeling stressed angry, confused, frustrated, unsupported, feeling helpless, being fearful and being worried about their futures. So, uh, you know, in summary, this research has been able to describe and quantify what service providers already know about victim recovery, specifically that victim survivors of sexual exploitation experience complex and co-occurring support needs. The research also demonstrate that support needs are partly attributable to experiences of exploitation. However, some issues were pre-existing but exacerbated by the exploitation. The research also highlighted differences between crisis, transition and longer term support needs and the impact that each of those has on service delivery and recovery. So victim survivors sought support and engaged with service providers at different points in their recovery journey. Excuse me. Um, and this affected the nature of the supports they required immediately, um, as well as in the longer term. So, for example, victim survivors who had only recently left their exploitative conditions were focused primarily on ensuring their immediate safety and security, including financial st stability and safe housing. But in comparison, clients who had exited, you know, months, months or even years prior were more focused on employment stability, developing their informal support networks and longer term goals around mental health and trauma recovery. The support needs of victim survivors also changed over time. Uh, victim survivors often fluctuated in their progress towards goals. Well, they changed their goals entirely because of changes in their circumstances. Uh, and further to that, specific needs may not have been identified when a victim survivor first entered the service, but emerged later once the victim survivor had, um, you know, developed a more trusting relationship with their caseworker and the caseworker's knowledge of the client improved. The significant differences between client support needs and goals uh, really highlights the importance of flexible and responsive service delivery models. And finally, the analysis shows that there are needs of particular consequence to effective service provision, and those relate to insecure housing and precarious visa status, which impacted all other aspects of support. Uh, so it's important that victim survivors have their primary needs met as a first priority in order for them to engage with support services more fully and on an ongoing basis. 
And so to finish, I'll leave you with this quote from one caseworker who said, I think the environment would uh, you would be aiming to create is security. No work on trauma can be made until that basic security is met. If that's not in place, it will not happen. Uh, so thank you for your time today. And the report is available now, which you can access for free via the QR code uh, on your screen or also via the AIC website. Mm -hmm.